Welcome to Chapter 2. In this chapter we will look at the role of models, and in particular global circulation models, as the basis for climate change science. Early in the 20th century, a Norwegian named Wilhelm Birkner claimed that atmospheric physics was advanced enough to forecast weather by calculation. He came up with seven equations that predicted large-scale atmospheric motions. Unfortunately, these equations did not provide fast calculating methods, nor provide accurate forecasting techniques. The complexity of weather processes is such that even the crudest models were improbably calculation intensive. It was not until simple computers were developed that National Weather Prediction, or NWP, was feasible. The first time National Weather Prediction was carried out was by the Royal Swedish Air Force Weather Service in Stockholm, and this was launched in December 1954. It forecast weather three times a week, and shortly thereafter, National Weather Prediction was implemented in most Western countries. There are considerable differences between national weather prediction and climate modeling. National weather prediction models are designed to predict we regional weather conditions in the short term and the medium term. That's one to three days and four to ten days. Climate models, on the other hand, although they're derived from these models, are designed to predict weather conditions many years into the future. Given the moderate at best accuracy of models in the short term, how is it feasible to predict weather conditions so far into the future? The simple answer is statistics. Climate models are not designed to give an accurate forecast on a daily basis, but rather to predict means and variability in climate indicators, to give a statistically accurate picture of climate, not weather conditions. To continue this comparison, we will contrast various aspects of NWP and climate models. Firstly, the goals are very different, and the spatial coverage for NWP can be either regional or global, whereas climate models tend to operate only on a global scale. The temporal range for NWP is days, and for climate models it's years, and the spatial resolution follows a similar trend, very coarse for climate models and very fine for national weather prediction. The relevance of the initial conditions is very high for national weather prediction, and very low for climate models but for all other factors such as clouds, surface and ocean dynamics it's very low for national weather prediction and the initial conditions are very high for climate models. The model stability is similarly low in national weather prediction and very high in climate models. A time dimension is essential for national weather prediction but it can be effectively ignored in climate models. So the first question to ask is how does the climate work? The global climate system is the result of a link of atmosphere, oceans, ice sheets, also known as the cryosphere, living organisms, or the biosphere, and the soil, sediments, and rocks, which are the geosphere. Each of these will be considered in greater detail after this. Each of these systems is integrally connected to the others, and energy exchanges between them and within systems, as well as other interactions such as the provision of nuclei for rain droplet formation, determine the climatic conditions. However, despite the interconnectedness, an explanation must clearly focus on aspects separately and the linkages between these systems. Climate models allow us to study these aspects of the systems independently. GCMs stitch these individual models together through a process of linkages, the development of which has taken many years and a great degree of understanding of the climate. We'll begin our discussion of the components of the climate with the atmosphere. We've already gone through the roles of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, so we'll have a look at the vertical structure. The lowest level of the atmosphere, also known as the troposphere, is where the majority of weather processes take place since it contains 75% of gases and almost all water vapor and aerosols. The tropopause is an inversion layer which marks the upper limit of the troposphere. Above this, the stratosphere increases in temperature due to the absorption of UV radiation by the ozone layer. The stratosphere is very stable as a consequence and is not subject to the sort of turbulence and weather variations of the troposphere. The atmosphere above this level is mostly irrelevant in terms of weather, since it is extremely rarefied. 0.01% of the atmosphere, in fact, lies above the stratopause. The action and feedbacks associated with clouds are still poorly understood, and only recently have models begun to incorporate cloud cover in any comprehensive detail. 
According to the Stefan Boltzmann equations, the energy hitting the top of the atmosphere is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the Sun. At 150 million kilometers, the top of the atmosphere receives 1,368 watts per square meter, as measured by satellites. If the Earth were a perfect black body, it would absorb the radiation and then re-radiate it at a longer wavelength, as shown on the dotted lines. However, the atmosphere absorbs much of the radiation, and the Earth's hypothetical surface temperature of 255 Kelvin is considerably lower than the actual 288 Kelvin. This effect is known as the greenhouse effect. The atmospheric gases and aerosols also scatter much of the incoming radiation, reducing the amount that actually hits the Earth. This diagram shows the energy fluxes within the atmosphere. Notice that although 30% of incoming radiation is reflected directly into space, only 4% of long-wave radiation from the surface leaves the planet. The remainder is absorbed by the atmosphere and either reabsorbed by the ground or by atmospheric gases. Eventually this energy is lost to space, but the net effect over time is to increase the energy near the surface of the planet until an equilibrium is reached. Horizontal transfers are a very important component of our atmosphere. Because of the Earth's curvature, more radiation falls in equatorial regions than at the poles. Thus, between 40 degrees north and 35 degrees south, there is a net radiation surplus. Whilst near the poles there is a deficit, that is, the Earth radiates more energy outwards than it receives. To restore equilibrium, an interchange of heat from the tropics to poles occurs through the movement of air. If this did not occur, the tropics would be on average 15 degrees Celsius warmer than they currently are, and the poles would be as much as 25 degrees Celsius colder. This latitudinal transfer of energy occurs in several ways, involving the movement of sensible heat, that's convection processes caused by heating, rising, and dispersion of surface air. Through latent heat, that's evapotranspiration processes involving evaporation of water vapor from the oceans and transpiration from land. And ocean circulation, which we'll discuss in more detail later. There are balances for this movement in terms of mass. For each packet of air that moves polewards, a similar quantity moves towards the tropics, setting up circulation cells. The rotation of the Earth set up the Coriolis effect, which also affects the movement of the air masses. These energy fluxes are the principal components of the climate, hence actions which interfere with the fluxes necessarily affect the climate in a major way. The oceans are divided into two distinct layers. The upper layer, known as the seasonal layer, comprises primarily warm mixed water and that stretches up to 100 meters deep in the tropics. This is the layer that interacts with the atmosphere. The second layer is separated from it by an inversion layer, and the deeps contain more than 80% of the water in the oceans. The ocean is vital for the climate because it holds far more energy than the atmosphere. This is primarily because the ocean has a higher heat capacity, about 4.2 times that of air, as well as a much higher density, at least a thousand times that of air. The seasonal layer alone contains more than 30 times as much energy as the entire atmosphere. Thus, a change in the energy of the climate system will affect the atmosphere 30 times more than the ocean. Clearly, a very small perturbation of the oceanic system can affect the atmosphere in a very large way. Other heat transfers the, for the atmosphere are through the evaporation of water vapor, which passes its energy to the atmosphere when it condenses into clouds or when it precipitates. Vertical energy transfer in the oceans is primarily at the poles. As seawater freezes, the salt remains in the unfrozen water, and this dense saline water tends to sink to the bottom of the ocean. As it does so, it takes its heat with it. The oceans are also involved in the lateral transfer of heat. Warm water flows towards the poles, raising the temperature of polar areas, and cold water flows back towards the tropics, carrying nutrients from the seabed. The world therefore has an extensive global thermohaline circulation, which has been hypothesized to drive millennia-long climate changes. The biosphere is the sum total of all life on the Earth. Whilst it clearly is a component of terrestrial processes, it is useful to consider it as a separate system. The bio biosphere affects the albedo of the planet's surface considerably. Bare ground, such as desert, has an albedo of 0 0.3, whilst coniferous forests are generally much lower at 0 0.09 to 0.15, and consequently absorb far more solar radiation. The biosphere also affects the fluxes of certain greenhouse gases. 
whilst terrestrial vegetation can fix a certain amount of carbon in its structure, many species of plankton utilize carbon dioxide in the formation of their carbonate shells. When these plankton die, their shells sink into the ocean bottom, effectively removing it from the system and reducing the atmospheric concentration of gases by at least fourfold. The biosphere also generates large amounts of aerosols, such as spores, viruses, dust, bacteria, and pollen that scatter and reflect incoming radiation. Primary productivity in the oceans also generates dimethyl sulfides, which oxidize in the air to form small salt nuclei, around which droplets can form. These are responsible to a large extent for cloud formation over the oceans. The geosphere is the physical structure of the Earth, the soil, rocks and sediments of our continental masses, the outer crust, and ultimately the Earth's core. Variations over tens to hundreds of millions of years are due to changes in internal energies of the Earth. Plate tectonics change the shape of the surface and transform ocean basins or mountains, affecting energy transfers between coupled systems. Physical and chemical processes affect soil structure, moisture availability, and water runoff, as well as the flux of greenhouse gases and aerosols into the atmosphere. Volcanism can emit vast quantities of carbon dioxide from single events, as well as putting large amounts of aerosols into the atmosphere. These aerosols have been shown to reduce incoming radiation for several years. A number of different models are used by climatologists. It is often convenient to regard climate models as belonging to one of four main categories energy balance models, one-dimensional radiative convective models, two-dimensional statistical dynamical models, and three-dimensional general circulation models. These models are listed in increasing order of complexity and computational intensity. It is useful to remember that one need not always use the most complex model. Using a simpler model allows more runs to be carried out as sensitivity tests to assess the accuracy of modeling assumptions. Each of the different model approaches therefore plays an important role in determining our understanding of the interaction of climatic processes. We'll start with a look at energy balance models. These very simple models only really concern themselves with two things. Radiation balance, that's between incoming solar radiation and heat loss, and the latitudinal transfer of energy. Energy balance models may be zero-dimensional, in which case latitudinal characteristics are ignored. They may also be one-dimensional, in which case the dimension included is latitude. Temperature for each latitude band is calculated using the appropriate latitudinal value for various climatic p parameters. Radiative convective models are marginally more complex. They may be either one-dimensional or two-dimensional, with height always present as one of the dimensions. These models are designed to look at radiative transformations as energy is absorbed, emitted, and scattered within the atmosphere. They also look at the role of convection and vertical energy transfer through atmospheric motion. By considering surface albedo, cloud amount, and atmospheric turbidity, it calculates the heat absorption in various atmospheric layers. If the heating in a layer exceeds a certain value, known as the lapse rate, it will convect into the layer above, transferring heat energy. A good example of these are tropical Hadley cells. Statistical dynamical models are somewhat more complex still. They are generally two-dimensional, with one horizontal and one vertical dimension, although some models work with two horizontal dimensions. These models combine the horizontal energy transfer of EBMs with the radiative convective functions of RC models. However, the equator pole transfer is much more accurately simulated than in EBMs, based primarily on theoretical and empirical relationships of the cellular flow between latitudes. Energy diffusion is simulated using the laws of motion. Statistical relationships define the wind speed and wind direction within the models. These models are useful for simulating and studying horizontal energy flows and processes that disturb them. Global circulation models, or GCMs, enable us to get some picture of future climate responses to a given situation. As the IPCC puts it, GCMs are the only credible tools currently available for simulating the response of the global climate system to increasing greenhouse gas concentrations. The first GCM was developed in the 1950s by Norman Phillips. It was an incredibly simple model, 
comprising just two atmospheric layers and two hemispheric sectors in which the model runs. Other early GCMs involved up to five atmospheric layers over a simple oceanic model. The model would be set with a given carbon dioxide level and then allowed to run to equilibrium, at which point the carbon dioxide was raised to a new level and allowed to run to equilibrium again. Needless to say, such simple models were no more than a sketch of the likely climatic response, and contemporary models are considerably more complex. Furthermore, recent models allow transient or incremental increases in gas concentration to be modeled. They are three-dimensional and may comprise many thousands of individual cells. Global circulation models involve incredibly complex calculations of atmospheric functions, and the best we can manage within the auspices of this course is a brief outline of their function. The most complex current models are known as Coupled Atmospheric Ocean General Circulation Models, AOGCMs. They have between 10 and 20 layers in the atmosphere, and as many as 30 oceanic layers. Contemporary AOGCMs have a horizontal resolution of between 600 and 250 kilometers. This scale is very coarse for local planning, and the underlying topography is poorly represented. If necessary, results can be scaled down post hoc using a series of modeling functions, or by using regional modeling, but this is a complex and as yet relatively inaccurate process. However, despite the inaccuracy in the coarse scale, taken over the whole globe, this resolution results in an extremely large number of individual cells for calculation, at least 1.5 million oceanic cells and approximately 250,000 atmospheric cells. For a given time step, calculations are carried out for each of these cells over the whole globe, including energy exchanges between each of the 26 adjacent cells for each cell. Clearly, this is very computationally intensive, and it is no surprise that atmospheric predictions have been at the forefront of computer development since the early 1950s. So, what climatic processes are modeled in a GCM? GCM is based on thermodynamic equations and equations of motion, which are linked by density transforms and advection. Furthermore, radiation transfer functions and equations of water vapor are also interlinked through advection, cooling and heating, moisture, and heat of condensation. All of these separate functions are also interlinked with the heat balance and hydrology of the Earth's surface through transfers such as heat energy, snow cover feedback, precipitation, and evaporation. Some GCMs do not correctly provide a stable equilibrium condition under current climatic conditions. In order to ensure that they accurately do so, a number of flux adjustments are provided. Flux adjustments are non-physical correction constants that are used as correction factors to ensure that the models stay on track. More recently, through intensive exploration of more exacting physical calculations, some models have been developed that do not use flux adjustments. Some non-flux adjusted models are now able to maintain stable climatologies of comparable quality to flux adjusted models. Furthermore, there is no systematic difference between the outputs of flux adjusted and non-flux adjusted models in terms of internal climatic variability. Considering the incredible computing power necessary to run a full GCM, one would expect there would be a limited number of models. In fact, a number of different groups have developed and refined models over the years, and the IPCC third assessment report uses no fewer than 34 AO GCMs, some of which exist in several refinements. These models are developed and operated by 18 different climatology centers, including the UK Met Office, National Center for Atmospheric Research, Goddard Institute for Space Studies, and the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. Click on any of these links to have a look at their websites. These models are run nearly constantly, and the results of the models and their outputs are published on the Internet in order to allow planners and response modelers ready access. The diagram on the left shows the incredible complexity of atmospheric processes, and it is these processes that GCMs attempt to model. GCMs enable us to better understand the processes that drive the climate. Models that work better at describing climatic conditions generally give us an insight into how the various physical characteristics of the Earth are interacting. They also allow us to make informed and scientifically defensible predictions based on current understanding of the climate. By running the models on paleoclimatological data, an understanding of long-term climate effects far beyond the age of even the human race can be established. 
GCMs are therefore the best tools for all climate science and allow conservationists, planners and politicians to test different response scenarios. The effect of various factors on the climate are expressed as a forcing value. In other words, to what extent they force global warming. A forcing value is expressed in watts per square meter, the increase in effect of energy caused per square meter. There are many natural forcing factors operating over different time periods, from desertification, increasing the albedo of a planet, to the passage of the solar system through the galaxy. Even the movements and placement of continents over time has some forcing activity. However, these natural, also called external or non-radiative forcing factors, are independent of those which directly affect the energy balance of the Earth atmosphere system. These are called radiative forcing factors. Contemporary society has introduced many forcing factors into the environment. Climatologists' understanding of the various forcing factors varies, as shown in this diagram. What is certain is that the warming effect of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions far outweighs most other radiative forcings. As you can see on the left, stratospheric ozone generally provides a cooling effect by absorbing UV radiation, whilst it has a considerably larger warming effect where it is found in the troposphere as a result of human activities. It is assumed that most aerosols generally produce cooling effects in the atmosphere by reflecting solar radiation. An important exception to this rule is the action of black carbon soot, which tends rather to absorb most light and re-radiate it as infrared radiation into the atmosphere. The action of other forcing factors is very poorly understood, and so it is very hard to say with any certainty what effect they have on global temperatures. In order to predict future climate responses, the IPCC has modelled and detailed several different scenarios, as laid out in the Special Report on Emission Scenarios. These SRES scenarios fall into four main storyline categories. The first storyline is the A1. Rapid economic growth is coupled with the introduction of efficient technologies. In this scenario, global population peaks in mid-century and then decreases. Furthermore, global capacity building decreases the difference in per capita income between regions. This scenario exists in three separate sub-scenarios, depending on the energy policy. The first of these sub-scenarios is the A1F1, or fossil fuel intensive scenario, where fossil fuel use remains much as it is today. The second scenario, the A1T, involves an phasing out of fossil fuel use entirely. And the third scenario, A1B, is a balanced use of all sources. In other words, no one source dominates. The A2 scenario involves a very heterogeneous world, focused primarily on self-reliance. In this scenario, population growth is constant due to a slow change in the fertility rates. Furthermore, per capita economic and technological growth is also slow, and responses are primarily directed in a regional arena. The B1 scenario has similar population growth and global economy to scenario A1. There is a rapid transition to service economies which are low impact in terms of environmental impacts and a focus primarily on provision of clean, resource-efficient technology. Solutions to economic inequities are global, but there are no other climate initiatives. The final scenario is known as the B2 scenario. The emphasis on this scenario is on local solutions to economic, social and environmental sustainability. There is constant population growth, but at a slower rate than A2. There is slower economic and social growth, and it's focused primarily on a regional scale. Furthermore, there is a focus on environmental solutions and on greater equity, but on a regional again, rather than global scale. Since the current rapid change in climate is understood to be driven primarily by anthropogenic radiative forcing, future climate change is likely to be driven in a similar manner, barring some catastrophic natural events such as a meteor strike. Even the eruption of Mount Pinatubo, which poured vast amounts of light-reflective aerosols into the upper atmosphere, only produced a temporary cooling over a period of two years. The outputs of those greenhouse gases that drive radiative forcing described in the SRES scenarios differ depending on the human political and economic response, along with other effects such as land transformation. As can be seen in the diagram on the right, the A1F1, or high-intensity high fossil fuel usage scenario, also labelled the business-as-usual scenario, tends to have higher outputs of these gases. The B1 scenario has the lowest predicted emissions for carbon dioxide and methane, 
But in general, the A1T scenario, which maintains a global economy but shifts towards clean fuel sources, seems to perform nearly as well. However, the overall likelihood is that emissions are likely to increase at least to the middle of this century, and in many scenarios, even beyond that point. So, what outputs do we get from the GCM models? All GCMs are tested to ensure, first of all, that they correctly model previous paleoclimatological conditions to the present day. However, although they often agree on general trends for a given scenario, they may predict moderately different responses over time. Consequently, climate scientists tend to use several different models and scenarios for any given set of predictions or plans. The IPCC t third assessment report uses an average of as many as 20 model predictions when stipulating future climate trends, although as yet not all models have produced runs for all of the SRES future trend scenarios. As can be seen on the graph, different models can produce significantly different outputs, as highlighted by the bars on the right. Once again, we can see that the A1F1, or high-intensity fossil fuel usage scenario, tends to give the highest outputs, or in this case, give the highest sea level rise. Much uncertainty involves the quantity of land ice that will be added to the ocean, and to the m most extent, this model only involves thermal expansion of the oceans. GCM outputs model all climatic conditions for the globe, including air moisture content, temperature change for oceans, surface and atmosphere, and precipitation for each grid cell in the model. The output differs depending on the emissions and transformation scenario used. The first of these tables illustrates the change in precipitation for scenario B2. If you'll recall, this scenario involves possibly the least increase in emission of various greenhouse gases and it is clear that there will be a significant change in precipitation by 2100 involving drying in sub-Saharan Africa and throughout most of Central America as well as the Mediterranean region and increased rainfall primarily in the northern hemisphere. The outputs for the A2 scenario are very similar the only difference really being in the intensity with which these changes are observed. Once again, looking at the B2 scenario, or low emission scenario, we can see that we are likely to have a significant increase in temperature, particularly in the northern hemisphere. The two boxes for each region represent the summer and winter, or December to February and July to August temperatures. It is particularly worth noting that the range of temperature increased in the northern hemisphere around the poles looks to be very high and this may be accompanied by large melting events. Furthermore, virtually no place on the planet is likely to have a decrease in temperature, with only a couple of places being limited to a single degree temperature rise. Many climatic responses to changing conditions are linear in nature, either logarithmically through feedback mechanisms or as a flat trend line. However, paleoclimatological evidence points towards a number of prehistoric periods of extremely rapid climate change. This is typical of nonlinear systems with multiple stable equilibria, as detailed by Lorenz in 1993. In this situation, when conditions are pushed towards a threshold value, the transition to a new mode of operation or a new equilibrium value may be exceedingly rapid. This has also been seen recently in changes in large-scale circulation patterns detected by instrumental readings and in contemporary observations of regional weather patterns. Thus, it is entirely possible that certain effects will not follow a linear trend and we could see, see rapid shifting of some aspects of the climate, as detailed on the next slide. Most GCMs show a slowing of the Atlantic thermohaline circulation as the world heats up. However, some show the circulation stopping entirely as heating reaches a threshold value. The shutdown does not occur abruptly, but the speed with which it stops in the range of decades to centuries is affected by the rate of heating. Sea ice in the northern seas is set to reduce, and this process may be accelerated by feedback processes associated with the concurrent drop in salinity and the reduced albedo of polar regions. Furthermore, sea level rise may destabilize large polar ice masses, ice sheets, or even entire ice shelves, accelerating the rate of sea level rise. The observed variability of ENSO, that's the El Nino Southern Oscillation, indicate a transition to increased occurrence of ENSO in 1976, although not enough is known to say whether this is an anthropogenic effect 
or even if it is a long-term transition. Large-scale and possibly irreversible transformations in the biosphere, such as the growth of the Sahara Desert, have occurred even with minimal anthropogenic interaction. These can be seen as non-linear changes triggered by slow changes in forcing factors, and it seems highly possible that this could occur given the current level of anthropogenic disturbance. However, once again, not enough is known about this incredibly complex system to say this with any degree of certainty. There are several things to say in conclusion to this lecture. First of all, general circulation models are the best tool we have for determining the range and extent of climate change, as well as for working out what is likely to happen in the future. All current models agree that current climate change is a result of anthropogenic influences, and future climate change will depend on the current human response to that knowledge. Although GCM outputs are very large scale, they can be refined and downscaled to assist in prediction for smaller areas and for small scale conservation planning. Thus, the outputs from GCMs can be exceedingly useful in terms of conservation planning for responses to climate change.